Our speaker today is our leader, Bart Warden. Bart has been a longtime member of the Ethical Society and began attending Sunday meetings here in 1985 when his girlfriend Ruth Ann invited him to join her. A few months later, they were married by Walter Laut Lawton, who was then the Society's leader. Both of their children, Gary and Jeff, were welcomed to the Society and graduated from the Sunday School. Bart has had a number of roles within the Society as board member, Sunday School teacher, vice president, and president before entering the American Ethical Union's leadership training program in 1996. Upon completion of his internships at the New York Society for Ethical Culture, Bart returned here to the, East, uh, the um, Ethical Culture Society of Westchester as our clergy leader in 1998, which makes this his 22nd year in that role. In 2012, Bart added a new role when he became the executive director for the National Federation of Ethical Societies, the American Ethical Union, and today he is wearing both hats when he speaks with us about transcendence. His address today is titled, Moral Progress, A Humanist Considers Transcendence. Please help me in welcoming Bart to the lectern. So welcome everyone, and uh, thanks for coming out today. I really appreciate uh, your joining in on this uh, conversation. So I've been uh, talking this year about moral progress and the challenges to that and, and some of the hopes I have that we could actually achieve some. And uh, you may recall that some of the things we talked about are in the challenge end is that when we really consider how morality plays out in our current culture, oftentimes it does so in a way that is specific to the particular group that you are part of, right? So if you look at the political landscape right now, you could say, well, there are uh, red folks on the red side, folks on the blue side, and uh, what appears to be the case is that both sides feel that they are behaving in a fully moral fashion. And, and yet, uh, when you look at the other group, it's hard to imagine why they would possibly think that or say that. And so we have this division in our world right now, uh, a division that has not actually been uh, healed by morality, but in fact, morality is actually helping us divide. So one of the things I've been looking for is something that helps be an overarching uh, idea, I don't know, something or other, that helps us have a common place where we can kind of look to a common good. And that's been a bit hard to tease out, to be honest, right? Um, because the things that we tend to imagine are the common goods often are pretty well tied into our own particular perspectives. So I want to explore that a little bit more. So the two questions that I'm really looking at are, first of all, is moral progress possible? In other words, is there, do we have the potential to progress morally? Uh, and the second is, if it is possible, what are the pathways that we might engage in to help us get there? Right? And so um, I'm looking to Transcendence to provide some help on that front. Um, I am curious, um, how many people in the room believe they have had an experience of transcendence at some point in their lives, just so I get a handle on that picture. All right, so lots of us, but not all of us. Um, I think it's important, yes. I can, I have it right here. Fortunately, uh, yeah, that, that, funny that you should bring that up. So, uh, and, and that is an important part of this. Uh, you may notice it says a humanist talks about transcendence, and so, Throughout the ages, uh, transcendence has really been an idea that has been uh, you know, deeply embedded in a whole variety of cultures. Um, coming from a humanist perspective as I do, there are some limitations to what I see as uh, the possibilities for transcendence in my account. So yeah, let's get to the definition. Miriam Webster was kind enough to send this along. Transcendent, uh, 1A, exceeding usual limits, surpassing. B, extending or lying beyond the limits of ordinary experience. Or C, in Kantian philosophy, being beyond the limits of all possible experience and knowledge. 
Uh, definition two, being beyond comprehension. Number three, transcending the universe of, or material existence, uh, which would be kind of the flip side. You have imminence and transcendence, transcendence being fully other, imminence being fully close. Uh, and four, universally applicable or significant, such as the anti-slavery movement recognized the transcendent importance of liberty. That's from L.H. Tribe. So, got these various definitions. Of those definitions, there are only some that as a humanist I'm inclined to kind of want to go with, all right? So, uh, humanists like myself typically eschew this idea of supernatural and of um, having some access to a world that is really completely beyond experience. If it's completely beyond experience, why are we making comments about it, I guess, would be the humanist perspective here, right? If it's outside of your experience, then it's not something that you have enough knowledge and connection with to make sense to really talk about it, right? So I come from that point. So it's not that I'm saying there isn't anything else. It's just that without having some experience of it, it doesn't make sense to me to pursue conversation about it. Um, and so I, I tend not to. But some of these other uh, definition points are a little bit more like it. How about exceeding usual limits, right? Uh, that exceeding usual limits is, is one. And we can look at this personally, right? My belief is every one of us here has experienced transcendence in terms of exceeding what was a limitation that we had. Has anyone in this room learned how to read? Oh, oh, okay. Do you remember that as a life-changing experience for you? I remember the first book I read, One Fish, Two Fish, Three Fish, Blue Fish. It was very popular in my class at the time. And, uh, and I, I fully remember the experience of looking at the book and having this sea change in my level of understanding of what was on the page. Right? And I never looked back from that. Right? I never went back to thinking, gee, can I read? No, no, I can read, right? That was a life-changing event that exceeded what I was ca capable of doing in the past, all right? Um, has anyone here had a sexual experience? Sexual experience? Ah, no more hands on this one, okay. Uh, but let me tell you, uh, the first time I experienced sexual orgasm was a life-changing event. My life would never be the same after that because there was something that connected my biology to my uh, selfhood in a way that was very different from what went before, right? And it stayed with me, right? So when I'm thinking of transcendence, I'm thinking of things that kind of take us beyond um, and things that wind up sticking with us, right, in ways that are important to us. Uh, because so many of these things that we're able to do become aspects of what we're able to do more of. Um, and doing more of those things can make a really big difference in our lives. So, uh, how many people are familiar with Abraham Maslow? Okay, all right. So, um, he's kind of popular in, in humanist circles. Come on now. And they don't have a whole PowerPoint, so not to worry. <laughs> it's just it's a few slides. <laughs> yes, we want to present to external display. Thank you very much. Like present to external display. Okay, thanks. they could only really just listen and do exactly what we want at all times. So Abraham Maslow was a psychologist uh, in the 20th century and uh, he had uh, these ideas about what motivated people to, to act, right? What were the things that, that got people going? And you probably have seen this at some point in your life. Maslow's hierarchy of needs set up as a pyramid. Right? So what he was thinking is like, look, if you look at human experience, you have to wonder what are people looking to do 
and what are the things that make it possible for them to do it. Um, I, he has a quote here, which I did like quite a lot. It's quite true that we live by bread alone when there is no bread. But what happens to our desires when there's plenty of bread, when our bellies are chronically filled? At once, other and higher needs emerge, and these, rather than physiological hungers, dominate the organism. And when these, in turn, are satisfied, again, new and still higher needs emerge, and so on. This is what we mean by saying that the basic human needs are organized into a hierarchy of relative prepotency. Do without the prepotency, but anyway, the basic idea is <clears throat> if your physiological needs aren't being met, it's very difficult to pursue other kind of things. But once they are met, chances are you'll be looking to think, what's next? Right? We are a restless species in many ways. Right? Um, so once you're, you know, you got food and you got shelter and you're basically safe and sound, that sort of thing then it's likely that you're really looking around at your relationships. You know, how are we doing with my friendships, my, uh, my love relationships, my uh, family, those sorts of things. Um, and when you have that sense of belonging, you might then start wondering, well, how am I doing with that? And am I, uh, do I have a sense of uh, satisfaction and esteem for the way I've been living and the connections that I have and life in general, that sort of thing. Um, and then when people are basically feeling reasonably self-confident, then it's time to really go to the top of this pyramid on self-actualization. Right? This is where self-actualization uh, popped in. So all those folks from the 80s and uh, other parts of our, uh, the, the decades in the in the 20th century where they were going out to find themselves and that sort of thing. Um, you really can't blame Maslow. He was just trying to describe experience, but certainly it helped. It helped kind of give the sense that self-actualization was really important. Um, and in his early years, Maslow was saying that was the top of the pyramid. Once you get there, once you are self-actualized, you are fine. So what were the uh, complications with this? Well, the first part is self-actualization is very individualistic, right? In other words, it's all about me and my actualization. And when people pursue their own stuff for themselves in a uh, fulsome uh, kind of way, in a full way, in, in a full-bodied way is what I was going to say, they tend to overlook certain things like, you know, what is this doing to the people around me? You know, uh, to what degree is my self-actualization actually dependent on what other people are doing that I'm not acknowledging and recognizing and that sort of thing. And near the end of his life, uh, Maslow started thinking, you know, I, I kind of got that top of the pyramid wrong. Um, because when I'm looking at the self-actualized people as examples, I'm noticing that there are very different people in this group that I consider self-actualized, right? And for him, self-actualized are people that are fully satisfied with their choices in life, that are feeling like life is worthwhile and that sort of thing. What he was finding, though, is that a good chunk of these people, and in fact, the people that he was most interested in, really weren't so much caught up in what it did for them but what was going on in the world outside of them, right? How they were connecting to a larger universe, to a, a, a larger uh, question about existence, those sorts of things. And he started realizing that really, once people are actualized, they probably would be moving further beyond that into something that goes beyond just being actualized, that transcends. Right? And so he came up with the term, uh, tra uh, I think he came up with self-transcendence. If he didn't, you know, he used the word uh, like becoming transcendent or something along those lines. Uh, and uh, he used a lot of uh, letters in his stuff. So I, have, I haven't been able to quite tease out all these pieces because I wasn't going to spend my entire life reading Maslow getting ready for this one address. However, the points of this are strong to my mind. And so if you look... Other people uh, started thinking, 
other people started thinking, come on, thank you, that in fact if Maslow had a different idea for uh, what these are, how would that work out in terms of this pyramid? All right, so he, it's a slightly different pyramid that uh, has de been developed, uh, who is this, by uh, Wang, I think it is, Paul Wang. Oh, no, but it was created by Ting Zhang and Hua Dong, not Wang, Dong. Anyway, so uh, what they did is kind of split the pyramid in half. So on the one end, you're looking at what they were calling deficiency needs. Those things, if you lack them, basically you'll feel this tension and, and want to find some way to kind of build them up. Um, but then the top half, they're, cons they're called growth needs. And this is a, a, a lighter kind of uh, restlessness for most people, right? I mean, think about it for yourselves, you know? Uh, when you can't pay the rent, is that the same for you as thinking about what you're gonna read in your next book group, uh, group right? You know, so these are needs for, for, for growth in both cases. Um, but when it's a matter of taking away your basic need stuff, we tend to have a different attitude and feeling state around that. But one of the things that holds together the uh, top half here is this sense that when you uh, pursue them, you're actually growing, right? You're actually benefiting in some kind of way. Um, and uh, Maslow uh, actually was the person, I believe, who came up with the term peak experience. Anyone had a peak experience, by the way, peak experience? Okay, peak experience. So peak experience has to do with, you know, you have this really full, intense experience. Uh, some people say it's like an experience of like feeling the part of the universe in some grand sort of way or, or feeling really deeply connected, those sorts of things. Um, and, you know, having had a few of them, I can say it's, it's really cool. Uh, and uh, it's not a, I think it's a, a, a welcome thing to get yourself into position so that you can have peak experiences. Um, I, I still remember 1976, 77, coming back from uh, Michigan with a bunch of my uh, fellow classmates for a break, you know, driving across Pennsylvania, and we said, wow, there's like this city that's in the distance. There's these lights there, and it just, it, it's not, we're not getting closer to it. We're not getting closer. We're not getting closer. We're not getting closer. And, that, you know, and so we finally pull over, get out of the car, and it's the Aurora Borealis in Pennsylvania. It's like, wow. You know, how can you not be taken by that? Or how about that first look into the Grand Canyon, you know, uh, or, you know, other. Uh, uh, other monuments, you know, it, they inspire a sense of awe, uh, and they're they're wonderful. Now, the thing about peak experiences is they can lead us to this belief that when we pursue different kinds of experiences, we can reach different levels of experience, right? which is really cool. The downside of peak experiences, you know, there's a reason they say peak. Right, every peak has a trough, and uh, and so it's not likely that your that all of your peak experiences certainly will stay with you, and certainly not at the same level. But Maslow also was interested in what he would call plateau experiences, and these are the experiences that you get to a new level, and it sticks to you, and it stays with you. And it becomes part of who you are and, and how you behave and, and what you do and that sort of thing, right? Plateaus, right? That's why I gave the, the reading thing before, right? Reading, I would say, is a plateau transcendence for us as we're growing up and becoming part of the, uh, uh, part of the, the culture that we live in, right? Plateau experiences. Um, and for a humanist, and in particular for an ethical humanist, looking at the concept of moral progress, plateau experiences would need to be part of that work, right? In other words, we would need to be reaching plateaus where we were having the tools that we need to make progress and to sustain progress. 
right? Because progress really needs to be held on to and carried forward, not just achieved as a, a peak moment of excitement, but something that has legs and has long-lasting impact. So what, uh, uh, I've, where is it now? So there's been a number of people working on self-transcendence theory. Uh, lots of them are the, uh, uh, what do they call them, the uh, psychological, positive psychology people. Anyone familiar with positive psychology movement? Yeah, okay. Uh, you know, so this is really a, a looking at what are the things that you can look to that will bring you into positive relationship with the universe that you're a part of. Right? And what are the ways that you can pursue, pursue that? Um, and one of the uh, practitioners of this is uh, Pamela Reed, um, who actually comes out of the field of nursing, I believe. Um, but she was saying, look, uh, self-transcendence uh, involves an expansion of self-conceptual boundaries uh, on multiple dimensions. Right? So she says it, it happens inwardly through your introspection, outwardly by your reaching out to others, temporally by kind of connecting to past and future. And she, at the end of her uh, working on this, really came up with this, also this notion of transpersonal expansion. And that's in which you connect with dimensions beyond the typically discernible world. Right? And this is where it starts to kind of leave me as a humanist, except that she uses the word typically discernible. Something for us to consider when we're wondering about transcendence and we're wondering about experience is to what degree we've been hemmed in by our culture and by our personal experiences and kept from experiencing something more because of those being hemmed in by what we've, what we've been told, what we've experienced in our own lives, or in our small little pocket, right? And is it possible that by extending ourselves a little bit more and putting ourselves into less familiar situations, we might begin to discern more, some different aspects of the universe than we typically have been? I say this, by the way, because <clears throat> it seems to me when I go to visit ethical societies, that one thing that I can reliably uh, count on is that no one in the room voted for our current president. <laughs> not only that, I think most people that come out, if not all of them, find it incomprehensible that someone who had voted for the current president would actually be in the room or would actually think that they belonged in an ethical society. You with me on this? Right, you feeling it? The thing is, there's something wrong with that picture, right? I mean, what are we saying about, there were a lot of people that voted, a lot of people. Are we saying that they aren't ethical and have no capacity for redemption? Are we saying that the, the only path for redemption is to become like us? Um, and so when I'm thinking of transcendence and expanding our sensibilities, I have these folks in mind. And I'm wondering to myself, where is the field where we can come together commonly, where we can experience the universe in some kind of way that helps us tease out a common good that we can agree on? This is no small feat. It's no small feat because it's easy to be captured by our experience and by our communities, right? To be, uh, you know, just tied up in the, uh, the current uh, horse race uh, in the political realm or in uh, our unhappiness with decisions being made and by the administration and those sorts of things. And to not be able to, to kind of keep going past that enough to experience a bit broader kind of connection to something else. Right? But that's really an area that we need to be moving toward. 
So uh, I mentioned Paul Wong before, and um, he was looking at self-transcendence with kind of a, a, I think, a point of view that people in ethical culture would find quite friendly, let's put it that way. Um, and so he says, the four defining characteristics of self-transcendence are these. A shift in focus from self to others. Right? Again, self-actualization popping over here. Transcendence means you let go, you park some of your own worries and concerns and things along those lines for a while anyway so that you can have more energy and thoughtfulness around how you can connect to a larger world, right? A shift in focus from the self to others. Uh, and they said that this is a shift from selfishness and egoism to consideration of the needs of others. Right. A shift in values. And uh, Wong says, those who have achieved self-transcendence no longer find themselves driven by extrinsic motivation or external rewards and demands, but by intrinsic motivation. The reward for an activity is the activity itself. All right, think about times when you've engaged in uh, service projects, for instance. Anyone done like uh, Habitat for Humanity? Um, uh, feed uh, people through a, a, some kind of feeding program, et cetera, et cetera. Think about what it's like in those experiences, right? Do you really feel like, man, this would have been so good if somebody paid me to do this, right? No, right? These things about self-transcendence really meet our needs at a deep intrinsic level, right? Because they help us tie into this notion of goodness and participating in it outside of any extrinsic rewards or people you know, shouting accolades or that sort of thing. Right? The third is an increase in moral concern. Right? It brings a more intensive focus on doing what is right, not just doing what is expedient, but will get you over the finish line. Now the last one is a little bit less familiar, I think, to ethical societies. Um, and it reflects, a, a few months back, one of the things I was really thinking about is, you know, we, we, we talk about how our ethical project is to bring more compassion and to bring more justice and fairness into our communities and into the world around us. Um, and I thought, you know, there is another component that I'd really like to see that would be important too, and that is joy. In what way does our activity in the world also increase the level of joy in the world? That, that sense of, you know, I'm just really happy to be alive sense, right? Uh, and so the, the fourth element in uh, Wang's uh, idea here is emotions of elevation. Experiences of higher order emotions can be triggered by all three of the characteristics described above, but these emotions become part of the picture. And what he's looking at are awe, ecstasy, amazement, feeling uplifted, feeling elevated. Aren't these things that we would like to see? And the thing is, if you really focus on self-actualization as your main thing and try to get these things for yourself, it's not likely that you're going to find it or that it will stick with you in the kind of way that you'd like to see. Right? Because the self-actualized self is pretty lonely in the end. Right? You don't really have a community in self-actualized life. You, you have people that have kind of helped you get there and that sort of thing. But they become, in many respects, means to your self-actualization. It's hard for them to be ends in and of themselves in that constellation. But that's what it takes for us to reach a place where we are fully engaged in life and where life can actually recharge us 
right? The, the other downside of self-actualization is it, it runs out. It runs out. You lose your energy. You lose your stuff, right? Because it's all caught up in your own personal strivings. But the world is much bigger than us. And when we connect to that larger world, and when we feel that larger world penetrating us, really becoming part of us, really, really, when you think about that intrinsic part, what that's saying is you're feeling it inside of yourself, and you are now feeling part of something much larger. And that's a very good thing to have. And in fact, without that, I don't think we can expect that we'll see the kind of progress that we would like to see. So my encouragement to you is to spend some time figuring out ways that you can pursue transcendence in this kind of way. What are the avenues open to you? You know, so often uh, the transcendence that we're most familiar with is a matter of your, your skills, right? And, and working at it and exercising and things along those lines. Well, I think this kind of transcendence fits that as well, right? You have skills that will help you connect. You have experiences that you can draw upon and build upon that will help you feel that level of connection and make a good use of that for the world around you. And so let's do that together. Let's find more ways to kind of reach those plateaus and to help our plateaus infuse the plateaus of the people around us so that we together can reap the benefits of real moral progress.